Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. This is a really exciting event. Sugar and I were just wondering at dinner how many years it has been since she's been at the Poison Pen, and it's an appalling number. It, it is an appalling number. It's, it's at least in the double digits, and maybe, huh, you know, in the kind of middle double digits. So she came to visit us often with Lydia and Bill, and then other books intervened. And now, I'm sorry, sir, we are, so you could move over slightly so you have some sort of a sight line. <laughs> or, or sit right up there. Yeah, okay, great. Um, anyway, um, I'm delighted that Bill and Lydia have come back and in a very unexpected place. So I want to know. How come they're in Mississippi, which is not where you would expect to see two New York detectives, one of them Chinese? It wasn't where I expected to see me either. <laughs> um, I was in Mississippi because a friend of mine moved there and said, come visit me. And I said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I did go. And um, I discovered down there when I was hanging out with him that there is a historic Chinese community in Mississippi. And I, I discovered this because he said, um, he knew I would like to take photographs, and he said, you know, there's this great um, Chinese cemetery. And I said, but well, wait, Chinese cemetery? There's enough Chinese down here that they have a cemetery? He said, yeah, you know, the grocers. <laughs> what? Um, so he told me the story of the Chinese grocers of Mississippi Delta. This is a hundred year um, uh, community, hundred year long community. Uh, some of them are still there. I was amazed, and I felt like I was being handed a Lydia Chin book on silver glass. And if I didn't write this book, uh, uh, you know, the literature gods would decide I didn't, I wasn't interested in Lydia Chin anymore. So I did some research, and I went back and did some more research down there, and I came back up here and did some book research, and I went back down there, and um, I finally started working on the book, and uh, it, it is based in historical fact, which um, just, a, just a story that nobody knows. This is one of those American stories that just, when I was a kid, um, Mississippi was a story of black and white. And the idea that there were Chinese people, there were also Jews, there were Lebanese, there were Italians, um, there were Native Americans who never left. Uh, this was amazing to me, so that's that's where that came from. Sort of like New York, but diffused. Yeah, yeah, and 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 a little um, less expected. Sure. Now, one of the things um, that Sharon and I were talking about, um, there was a Chinese Exclusion Act passed in the 1880s when the railroad building came to an end, and people weren't happy with having so many Chinese here. But it was restricted to laborers, so Chinese grocers were merchants, and so they were able to come. But tell us what Paper Sun means, because the title of your book is relevant to all this. Yeah, uh, Paper Sun, um, in, in general, the people who came over were men. They came over to make money and support their families. And the way that the Chinese Exclusion Act worked, you couldn't come unless you were a merchant or a scholar. Unless, unless, you were related to an American citizen. That is, the men who had come over early and um, been naturalized, and before the Chinese Exclusion Act, you could get naturalized, could then go back to China and come back and go back and come back and register the births of children in China and then sell their names and their life histories to young men who wanted to come over who would claim to be one of those children. And that was a paper son. And a lot of the uh, American Chinese whose people came over between, oh, say, 1885 and um, 1920 were paper sons. And you would take someone else's name and your entire thousand years of, of ancestry in China was essentially wiped out. You were now um, a Tam, not a Chin. And this is this was kind of rampant. And you had to you had to memorize everything there was about your paper father's native village and 
and the area and the house he grew up in and, and all of this stuff because the um, the uh, immigration people were, were onto it, but you couldn't prove with any particular person that he was a fraud, that he was a fraud. Um, and so a lot of people got through this way. Once they were through, then, and, and, and became um, uh, merchants themselves, if they did, uh, then they could um, go back and, you know, get wives, and, and that was how, um, in Mississippi, that's how the, the community grew. In, in New York, uh, and in the, in the Chinatowns of the East, it still was a, a big, what they call a bachelor society. Um, they couldn't, because most so many of them were liberals, they couldn't uh, bring wives. So anyway, it's part of the plot, but I thought you might be interested in why it's called interest, and so I should call it paper son. So we're going to move over to Patrick and Jim, and where are we heading to? Some other part of the South. Well, thanks everybody for coming out, and um, it's always a real a treat and an honor to have uh, my good friend James Salas here, and we're, we're trying to figure out how long we go back, and it's, who knows, 26 years, something like that. Um, I recently had the uh, the good fun of looking after Jim's cats when he was gone. And, uh, I, I just want to stick my two cents in here. Jim sometimes comes to New York and looks after my cat when I'm gone. So, you know, it's a very uh, small world. I can't stand cats. But, <laughs> but um, there's always so much to talk about. But the first thing I wanted to bring up was how, what a, how wonderful it is to finally see the Lou Griffin books coming back out on these gorgeous new uniform editions. They are, between now and December. Right. Yeah, so I've got them all on order and they're releasing, you know, every few weeks. So it'll be terrific. Yeah, absolutely. And then the new book, Sarah Jane, um, I don't know, it's always hard to ask Jim, what, tell us about your new book. <laughs> um, however, the one thing I did want to ask is that uh, at the beginning, the dedication, um, you dedicate this to stu your students past, present. I know we have some of them here tonight. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, about that. I know you've been teaching for a long time, and it, it seems to really energize you and, uh, and keep you going. It, I think the dedication says, you know, the teachers who remind me why, you know, we do this. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think I've, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have feedback. She had feedback. This is unfair. <laughs> uh, one of the major reasons I teach is uh, when you become a writer, uh, you're so involved in the commercial aspect of the whole thing, trying to get the contract signed and find out about rights and on and on and on, that you get a little further every day from what made you want to start doing and when I'm teaching, I see students coming in, learning to write, writing well, writing better. Uh, it just reminds me that when I was 12, 14 years old, and sitting in Arkansas, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, uh, the most important thing in the world were for this, the, this folks and, and being able to write and to try to talk about how I saw the world. So every time I teach, As for Arkansas, I just want to say that what was a, uh, an adventure for Lydia and for Shira uh, is nostalgia for me <laughs> because I grew up in Helena, Arkansas, which is about an hour from Clarksdale, right across the Mississippi River. And when people say, oh, Arkansas is beautiful, I say, my part of Arkansas is actually part of Mississippi. They just put the line in the wrong place. So I was particularly enjoying uh, Shira's book because I so many fond memories of those wonderful meals. <laughs> Helena is the only part of Arkansas I have been in. Um, because when I was in Mississippi and I said to my friend, um, I, you know, now I, one more state I can cross off. He said, well, what's left? And I told him, and there were like six states left, one of which was Arkansas. He said, well, we can take care of that. Let's go have lunch. And we went across, <laughs> went to the diner for lunch. We drove around Helena a little, saw the, the, the um, yeah, the church, right. <laughs> Um, you know what I mean, and uh, and came back. <laughs> so. Helena was, uh, it's right on the river, it's a huge river town, and it was one of the, the towns on the Blue 
Christ Trail, all the people coming up from, from the deep south would come up through Clarksdale across the river to, to Helena, up to West Helena, back over to Memphis, and then from there to St. Louis and Chicago. So uh, everybody came through, and Robert Johnson actually lived in Helena for a year or a year and a half. So. Was that where the King Biscuit Flower Hour? It was. was. I listened <laughs> to it every day at 12 o'clock. I did, and everyone made fun of me. Still but even then, I knew I was strange. Um, and actually, this is sort of kind of a question for, for both of you. You know, in writing classes, we're often given this, what I think is the worst bit of advice ever, which is write what you know. You know, um, ha you know, half the books out there would not have been written if people stuck to that. You know, and in this, you know, if you're writing from a woman's perspective, you know, you can't do that. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? And you know, obviously writing from Lou Griffin, he's a black male, you know. Well, I think it's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard, and I'm not really sure where it came from. Uh, I, 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 the joy of writing is, is getting in someone else's head and seeing how they see the world and experiencing things that you can't experience on your own. And I, you know, I, I started off reading a lot of science fiction, and I, I, I became very enamored of, of describing worlds and other ways of thinking and other ways of living. And I just Two books now with a female point of view, uh, six with a, a black point of view, one with a very happy homosexual. Uh, <laughs> and I'm thinking seriously about writing about a moth or a dog or something. <laughs> but we'll, we'll see what happens. Moth, I'd like to see. Dogs have been done. Um, <laughs> Many times. A pigeon. But a pigeon, a pigeon. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I also, when, when people ask me, you know, shouldn't I be writing what I know? And I, I, I generally think you write what you know emotionally. You write what you know if if you're um, a dental technician and you love your work, but people go, how can you do that? Um, then what you know is what it feels like to love something that people kind of look down on and they don't understand, and you know, they're scared. or they're scared, or, you know. So that's something you know, but you don't have to write about a dental technician unless you want to. Um, I, I agree. I think that creating worlds and getting in other people's heads, um, other creatures' heads, is is uh, why we do this. You know, wouldn't it be interesting to be? And then you can you go off and and to just write someone just like you, only they're doing maybe more interesting things than you do, is um, it's kind of a waste of, of the of the opportunity. I'm looking up there at the, the new Margaret Atwood, right? The Testament. Um, you know, the, the, that whole world would not have been created. In fact, none of the world she inhabits would have been created if she, if she had only written what she knew. Um, but emotionally, she does. So yeah, I, I think that, that as, as writing advice in, for um, setting plot and character is, is nonsense. Now, just want to ask you about the Lou Griffin books again. Um, how is your how is your attitude kind of you know a certain number of years have passed now since the first one came out in the early '90s? How have they kind of in your mind kind of aged? I'm thinking about writing an essay on that actually. Uh, I had to reread all of these books uh, because it had been so long, and I was as I was proofreading them because we uh, they, they're they're so old that they weren't. Uh, so I had to proofread very carefully. So I, I read all six very, very close together, and it was a very interesting experience. Uh, I'm not sure who that person was who wrote those books, and I alternately thought he was just incredibly smart or he was just getting away with a lot of stuff. <laughs> and it was, it was very odd, but I think I, there is nothing about them I would change. And I, I was learning to write novels as I was writing those. I was always a short story writer, so I was trying to figure it out. Uh, and it, it's, it so fascinates me that I actually made notes about my uh, impressions as I was reading, rereading the books. And I think someday I probably will write an essay about that. I wrote one about writing the last of the Griffins and saying goodbye to Lou. And this one had to be 
saying hello again. <laughs> You know, this is a, excuse me, say, this is a really different age um, in a lot of ways. And one of it is there's this huge premium, or dislike now, I should say, I reverse that, on what cultural appropriation. Jim can't write a black character. Sure can't write a Chinese character. If you're a man, you can't write a woman, vice versa. If you're not gay, you can't write, you know, an LBG um, book. And I think it's just a straitjacket. For authors, I'm really appalled that we're in a we're in, in such a alt left alt right world at the moment. You know that that um, it really is stifles creativity. I think and, you know people should be able to tell the stories based on their emotional content or whatever it is that they want to tell. Luckily, you've been writing Bolivia for so long. This probably won't come up. And Jim, you know, I, have you run into any comments about these coming back now? No, but I'm fully anticipating for the reasons you said. I do that, too. That I probably will. I, I had no trouble the last time. No, of course but not. This but was that was around then. So. Yeah, it was at least what was it? Twenty-five years ago or something? Because I mean, the first time we met you, you were writing the Lou Griffins. Right. You hadn't done a long time. any of your interesting. I've always loved Jim's thriller, where the whole premise was he had a spy, and the way they, how was it when they, they tried to catch him by running away from him? Yes. I always thought that was such a great premise. I'm reading the Jew, John Macari, and I wanted to send him a note. Dear David, <laughs> you should really read James Salas' book and you know, try the idea of you know, catch a spy by running away from it, which was just brilliant. So the Lou Griffins, after that, you took off in a lot of interesting directions, didn't you? Yes, and I'm still going in interesting directions. Oh, you are. Right. I've been fortunate enough to find publishers who would uh, follow me in those directions, and that doesn't always happen. So I'm really blessed. I'm sorry, sure, I interrupted you. Can no, I, I, I just, I had a, I had, I had a much less interesting question. <laughs> I just, well, I, I just wanted to know when you reread them, did you read them, reread them from the beginning straight through? So, so the way um, you're expecting now, readers will, will do it, because, you know, this, this is the first, and, and readers will pick that up, and then the others as they, as they come out. Did you see a change over the course of the, of the series? Well, you know, I, I, I remembered what I did with the series, which was intuitive, and I didn't plan it ahead. So I, I knew where I was going. I knew the arc of the story. But it was the details, the little things <clears throat> in volume two that I couldn't have known at the time were going to feed into volume four or uh -huh. volume five. So that was the interesting part. That, and that was the part where I thought I was really smart. Because <laughs> thought, oh boy, look what I did. Set that up really well, that. right? <laughs> My subconscious did that somehow. But I read them in very short order. And I'd always sort of claimed that they were really one long novel. Oh, mainly because people kept criticizing me for writing short novels. <laughs> but uh, they, it, it really did feel that way. And it, it really did feel like a, a solid thing, which, as I wrote, that wasn't. Why did you bring them to the end with that particular start stopping point? Had you completed the whole story arc, or uh, no? You just uh, wanted to write something else. I, you know, I, it was just going to be one book, and I was so interested in the character. I wrote another one, and then I wrote another one, and it just got to be a habit after a while. <laughs> uh, but I knew I knew about the fourth book where I was going and how it was going to be. Awesome. Now I remember. Um, I just have vivid memories of uh, I the Cricket when you were writing that book. I think you were living at 55th Avenue and Thomas, right in that area. And uh, it's not right there. It better than I do. Yeah, no, I just remember that. Um, and that, you know, that has always been my personal favorite of the Lou Griffin books, although they're all great. Um, as you're going through and rereading re them, did any particular one kind of stick out in your mind and say, hmm, I really like this, you know, uh, in a different way than you had before? I all, well, I, I'd always said that Moth was my favorite. Uh, this time it wasn't. My favorite was actually the last one. Uh, I, I, because it had an emotional density to it. It had a weight to it that I didn't think the others quite got. And I was just thinking, you know, I was getting better as I went on. Mm. But, you know, to turn it to Shira, <laughs> how long was it between the last And I'm, I'm interested because I'm wondering how you felt going back into it. Yeah. Well, the, um, the publication 
is 10 years. It's, it's 2009 to, to 2019. But I started writing this, uh, I started researching it in, uh, I guess, 2015. So it wasn't, and that was the research, and I started writing in 2016. <coughs> so it wasn't that long for me. Um, and I had never intended to give up the series, and I had written, in the meantime, a couple of uh, Lydia Chin's mother short stories, uh, which, you know, cracked me up. Um, and, and so I never really felt like I was away, and when I came back, it just seemed natural. I mean, I just kind of fell right back into Lydia's voice. Now, th there, are, there are some changes. Um, this one and the one before it, uh, which was also Lydia's voice, was Ghost Hero, are both kind of um, funnier in places than I have been. I just get, um, I feel freer about doing that. But I didn't feel like I, I'd been away, and, and the one I'm working on now, which is a Bill Smith book to follow this up, I also don't feel like I've been away from him. Uh, I just, those voices are so ingrained in me that, and I, I wrote four other books in the meantime, uh, all of, well, I mean, I wrote two, and then I went back to the series, and I wrote two more, and then, um, no, I wrote five, because one isn't published yet. All of them third person. I have not written in the first person, except for Bill and Lydia, um, except for some short stories, which are, are mostly, uh, <coughs> you know, really one-offs. So I just feel like I, I, I may run out of plot ideas, but if not, I could do this forever, because I just, those people are really deeply in my head. And the world's there, so that you sit down and you're just there. They're just there, yeah. yeah I, I don't have to reestablish, you know, Bill's apartment, where's the piano? I mean, I know all that. Yeah, but you've taken them to Shanghai, you've taken them um, Mississippi. Oh. I'm trying to remember where else they've gone, so, you know. Those are the two most exotic. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> equally so, right? They went, oh, they went so um, to Lahore. Shanghai was actually more natural <laughs> than Mississippi, if you really think about it. I was just truly blown away when I saw the, you know, the, the advanced reading copy that came my way and it said, Bill and Lydia, Mississippi. I thought, not really, surely. What are they doing in Mississippi? Proving that sure is right, that this is a whole American story that almost none of us actually knew, right? I mean, did any of you know that there was a Chinese community embedded in Mississippi? Alan Dell over there did. Ah, okay. Well, you're always smart. You read Max Allen Collins, so you're bound to know all these American stories. <laughs> but, I mean, I think that's one of the great things about crime fiction, or just reading fiction in general, is all the great stuff you learn that, you know, in the ordinary course of your life, you just, you just wouldn't have any reason to come across. But there it is, just on a platter right in front of you. Yeah. Now you can talk learnedly to your friends exactly. about you know, the Chinese cemetery in Mississippi or the Chinese exclusion law, which many of you had never heard of, right, till tonight. So I love that. Do you like learning that stuff when oh, you write? Absolutely. I mean, part of it is making shit up, but part of it is actually <laughs> just learning stuff that you can put into your books. Well, you know, and I think one of the delights of Ashira, in this case, uh, I've always liked the I, I'm a sucker for a really, really strong voice. But you know, to be able to confront uh, the Mississippi culture and the Mississippi world uh, as an outsider like that. And I think the humor that came out was some of the best parts for me. I mean, the old guys hanging around outside the store after it's been trashed and things like that. You know, it just seemed so true to the way people. Well, thank you, because you know, coming from a southerner, I did worry about that. It really is a different world. Yeah. Really well, it really is. I mean, I've talked to Greg Isles for I don't know how many books, you know, and he's like the bard of Mississippi, and I don't recognize Shura's books particularly, Shura's book, as part of the, as the Greg Isles universe, but then he's mostly in Natchez, you know, which is a very specific part of, of Mississippi. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is the Delta, and the Delta in uh, the two, the, uh, 2016 election, Mississippi went red, but the Delta went blue. It's a different place. It's not not that it's so wildly liberal or anything, but it's just a different place from the rest of Mississippi. And this, they get as far as Oxford, but Oxford is sort of extension of the Delta because um, it's uh, where Ole Miss is. So there, there's a whole <coughs> other set of history there. Um, so it's yeah, Greg Isles is, is not writing about 
My Mississippi, yeah. Which is another interesting thing that, that everybody's, um, I, I've been thinking about this because I'm, I'm, at BoucherCon I'm doing a, um, moderating a panel on setting. And I, I'm, I'm thinking that people's, you know, my New York is, is not um, the same New York. Not, not only is my New York not the same as other people's, but Lydia's is not the same as Bill's. Um, it's just, they're, they're different places. But the idea that this is actually a Mississippi that a southerner recognizes, uh, uh, Helena Montana southerner recognizes, <laughs> Um, Helena, Montana, Helena, Arkansas. Um, I find this very exciting. I have a question about uh, about your new book, Jim, uh, Sarah Jane. Um, I'm going to get this wrong. Was Others of My Kind the one uh, about the woman in the box? Yes. Okay, good. Anyway, uh, question is, you know, it's funny. Tell us a little bit about what inspired this particular character. One of the things I like about your book so much is that, you know, they don't, the characters don't uh, respond in the way that society thinks they should respond. Um, and they, especially in this new book, you know, Sarah Jane kind of, she's a, a veteran. She comes back and improvises this life. And it has a very, very much of that kind of improvisatory feel. Uh, not a question, but more of a comment. Well, no, that's true. Uh, it, interestingly enough, usually my novels start with a visual see. Uh, interestingly, though, the two that are in female points of view started with the voice. Uh, I, the person was talking to me. Others of my kind started that way. I went home and wrote what became eventually uh, not the first, but I thought it would be the first. And this was uh, Sarah Jane started talking to me one day, and I went and wrote it down. And that is exactly what is on the first and second page of, of the book. I was thinking at the time, I read a lot of biographies, and uh, I just seen what I call the, the biographer's fallacy. Uh, all too often, a, a, a poor biographer or a poor novelist uh, finds something in a person's childhood or early development, and that sort of explains that person for the rest of their lives. You know, he's the winner who has to always make it and always be best, or she's the charmer who knows exactly the right word. And that person never never changes. They just interpret everything in the person's life in light of that. And less ambitious literature does the same thing. If you read oh, uh, really, really strictly genre novels, the people are the same on the first page and they're virtually the same through the entire book. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, I don't know anyone's life that's like that. It seems that we're serial people. We keep changing, we're different people all the time as we go through our lives. And I wanted to write about that kind of person. And that was that was where it came from. First I heard the voice with Sarah Jane talking to me, and then I said, I'm going to write a story about someone who changes palpably and definitively in various stages of her life. And it was uh, it was a challenge and I didn't know if that structure would hold for the novel. So it was it was fun to, to find out and to find out more about her. So it was kind of biography coupled with other things? It, it's, you know, it's a woman's entire life, basically. Right. And I just, uh, I thought, well, you know, I have changed so much as I've turned through my life. And most of the people that I know, certainly my people I know well, they really were different people. And I, I wanted to, to make her that way tell the story and show how much she had changed. It's interesting because um, you know you mentioned that people don't fit these little these little categories and uh, or DSM numbers, you know, that kind of pinpoint people exactly what their little quirks are. Uh, but I thought, would I be wrong in seeing somewhat of a through line between Lamar from Will Not and a little bit of Sarah Jane? I remember I asked you a couple of years ago, um, is Will Not really a protest novel? Disguise, and you said yes, it is. <laughs> um, what do you think about that? Is there a through line between those two characters, anyway? Well, I think they're both strong characters uh, who really go their own way and manage to find, either find or blunder into a, the niche that allows them to do that. Uh, and that's always fascinating that, that you know someone who can actually see things differently and state things differently and live differently and and still. Unity, which will accept them, and, and that you know 
will not is all about the community. Sarah Jane is about Sarah Jane finding the community. That's a very nice distinction. I'm going to ask you a question. Can you pinpoint where the music started? Coming from before I do something homicidal. Alexa, stop. Thank you. Oh. Could the rest of you hear it? Yeah. 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 I was trying to figure out where it was coming yeah. from. Yeah. Okay, you got it. I think I got That's it. That's Warrior's power. Wow. <laughs> 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 really scary. I think I'm going deaf because I can't even hear. No, I seriously, it was yeah, just driving me crazy. Good. But Alexis um, will probably start up again. Don't even say that word. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be your fault. <laughs> okay. I was gonna point out that in um, in Shira's book, Lydia's mother, whom we thought we knew well, um, actually has a, a change, um, right, Jim? And um, you know, she's an unexpected behavior and so forth in this book that we have not seen before. So one value for her trumps another. Yeah, um, I, if, if, I mean, I assume most of you, you haven't read it yet. Uh, Lydia is thrown at the very beginning of the book because her mother says, you have to go to Mississippi. We have relatives there. I know you never knew that, but don't worry about it. We have relatives there. And one of them is in jail for murdering another one. And he didn't do it, so you have to get him out. And Lydia is completely um, thrown by a lot about this. But especially about by the fact that her mother is telling her to take a case. Her mother, who has never liked her profession and never liked her partner, it not only tells her she has to take this case, but that she can't go to Mississippi alone. Bill has to go with her. Right. And this is, um, to Lydia, just, she really does have to do it then. She has to do it. She's got to do it right. She's got to get this guy off because this is a total sea change um, as far as she's concerned. Now I think one of the things that happened is I've been writing these uh, Mrs. Chin stories and I've learned a little bit more about her mother. Um, you know, because I've been writing those. Those are uh, first person narration and I've been writing them from the inside. And um, she's a more complex character than I might have thought. Um, so, but, or but that yeah, you have allowed. That I have allowed, right. right. Okay. But um, yeah, in this case, family trumps Lydia's profession and her partner. That is, if, if, if Lydia can help out family, then she's gotta go do it. And that's the, that's the top uh, priority. And, um, you know, she, she, uh, she comes in through in a couple of other places in the book. So it's almost like Perry Mason in a sense. Whoop, did I turn that off? Yes, I was so busy at the music, right. Um, it's almost like a Perry Mason case in the sense that, you know, you know she's going down there for the defense, right? Um, because her mom has commanded her to make sure that her cousin, uh, who couldn't possibly have done it because he's a chin. Um, and I, I, I like that because, you know, an interesting twist, which I'm not going to say whether it happens or not, uh, would be if he actually turns out to be guilty. Well, and, and, this is and that's up for grabs, right? All the way through the book. This is something that worries Lydia a lot because um, her mother says, he's a relative of your father's, he can't have done it. And Lydia knows that that's kind of ridiculous, you know, that, that this is such a distant relation. This is not like one of her brothers. This is a, a, a distant cousin of her father's, and yeah, he could have done it. And maybe he did do it, and what's she gonna say to her mother if she can't make this come out okay? And that's a worry that all, all the way along. And I don't, um, actually know the answer. And she's really at, uh, completely at a loss because uh, her mother doesn't really tell her anything more than what she just said. So she's in an alien culture. She doesn't really speak the language. She can't eat the food. <laughs> they keep giving her sugared iced tea, which is about to kill her. And she, it would kill anybody after the iced tea. She, yeah, she yeah. has no idea how the law functions, and she's you know intertwined with them by necessity. So it's it's uh, it's just very very interesting to see her trying to put just a few pieces of this together. In, in a way, minus the crime, um, this is what happened when I went down there the first time. Uh, I was there with um, my friend Eric, who had just moved down there, and Ace Atkins, um, who, and they both understand Mississippi, in, in a sense, the way Bill did. Um, and then there was me, and I, I spent those first, you know, I think I was down there five days the first time, just going, oh my God, really? Oh wow, ah, 
you know, that's cotton. Is that the cotton over there? <laughs> it was, I had a good thing on Mars. Um, and you could have reversed that and tried to imagine, why does this keep going off? Must be the battery going. Um, how they would have felt if they'd suddenly been transplanted to Manhattan. I mean, it's just as alien to go, you know, from rural Mississippi to, you know, 55th and Park or something, is it? Would, absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah, you know, I mean, we've all spent time in New York, so it, it's a it's a place that's really different. Yeah. Well, you know, pretty much every place is its own thing, which is what I love about it. I was just thinking as I was wandering around, I got in early enough today to go for a walk, and I'm wandering around, and I'm thinking, gee, you know, I really could have stayed two or three more days just to see what goes on around here. I couldn't have, but I could have, you know. And I'm thinking, I don't think there's any place I've ever been that I didn't feel like that about. You know, like, this is interesting. This is worth knowing about. And so that was my attitude toward Mississippi. Nevertheless, it was astounding, uh, you know, as I, as, as I walked around and, and, you know. In Mississippi, when you are walking down the street and somebody's walking toward you, they say, hi, how you doing? And you're supposed to say, how you doing? Whether or not you know them, if you don't do this, it's rude. Um, if you do know them, you're also just supposed to actually answer the question and you know, exchange a couple of them. Um, but if you don't, you, how you doing? Um, in New York, we don't do that. York, <laughs> if you meet someone's eyes in New York, yes. you're, you're likely to hear, what are you looking at? <laughs> um, or if you don't hear that, at least what you what you know the other guy is thinking is, do I know her? Am I supposed to say something? Is she a friend of mine? Um, but in Mississippi, it's this total, you know, you, you, you greet people. Everybody greets everybody. This, you know, it's things on that level. Right. In New York, they carefully avoid it now by everybody staring, staring at their cell phones. So, you know, the traffic yeah. fatality ratio is rising or people stepping into manholes or whatever it is. This New York is actually littered with, you know, possibilities. Dead bodies. Well, you know, there are all those um, cellar door openings, you know, or the delivery guy. I mean, if you're not watching, you can really kill yourself while you're out of here. But it is a defense against having to make any contact with anybody. Uh, years ago, and I used to start going there, and I would go by myself. They always told you, hook your purse strap around your thumb. So they, thank you. Sorry, it really isn't me. I think it's the battery. Um, put your purse around your thumb so they can't grab it from you. Hold it under your arm and avoid all eye contact. Yeah. You know, just like that. Or if you're really being annoying, stare at them and intimidating. It's sort of the same technique you're supposed to use with a bear. Um, I'm serious, you know. <laughs> If a bear is really, who is it that, I just finished editing a book by Betty Webb, and um, it's one of her zoo books, and so a child falls into the wolf enclosure, and Lena has to go after it, and the wolf comes at her, and she remembers that the things you, you need to know about a wolf is you have to stir them down, make yourself as big as possible, and then she whips off her shirt and sort of goes like this, and the wolf is totally intimidated by it. But most people are so paralyzed with fright, you know, that they wouldn't do that, whereupon the wolf could eat you, right? Um, so in New York, it's kind of the same principle. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in New York, so it depends. And you know what, before, before it became more law and order, like 37 years ago, it was really scary to walk around there. Jim, you've been in New York back and forth for... I never had any trouble at all in New York, but it definitely was scarier. Oh, what, the, yeah. good old days, yeah. Yeah. the good old days, yeah. Certain parts of it. Yeah. So pursuing this theme, um, you haven't been back to Arkansas for a while? No. But no. you were able to draw upon your memory to write Sarah Jane without the benefit of travel? <laughs> I'll never forget. There's a family member <laughs> in the back. I will never forget, I promise. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's what Henry James, it, by the age of 15, you have enough to write for the rest of your yeah. <laughs> uh, I avoided writing about small towns for a long time. Well, not was was really the first time. Yeah. Because uh, there really is a lot of bitterness there. But uh, what you know, as Shira said, I think places are really, really fascinating. And I just had to find a story that I would allow me to write about small towns. You know, I think what what Shira said about places being different. We tend to forget that because we're becoming so homogenized. 
sure all the towns look the same, they have the same shops, the same malls, right. the same everything. And there are these small places that don't, and the South is full of them. And they're very distinct and very interesting places, and they are communities. Now, the people may have hated one another forever, but they stick together when things happen. And I just wanted to write about that, that part of the small town, not the part that two or three people own everything in the town, uh, which was the case where I grew up. There's a fondness for eccentrics, too, right, in the small town. My first girlfriend had Boo Radley, her, her uncle, living with her. And he would, as we were sitting on the couch watching TV or whatever we might be doing, uh, <laughs> the uncle would come into the room and walk into the corner and just stand there staring at the corner. I didn't realize that was strange. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was a little peculiar, but you know. Uh, but, you know, we were, in, in, in the South, we were proud of our eccentrics, and we take good care of them. And we, the duck lady in New Orleans, and you know, all of, all of these wonderful, wonderful people. And they're, 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 they're magic. They're kind of special in their character and their, their love. But yes, there is a lot of strangeness. <laughs> I have a question for Shira. Um, your, your training, your background was as an architect. Um, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but does that skill set, uh, being an architect, that kind of way of looking at the world, um, are there benefits and minuses when you try to approach that to writing? It's never been asked it quite that way before. Um, yeah, there, there are advantages, uh, and one of them is architecture is what's called, the process of architecture is, is what's called an iterative process. You can say it is better, but iter iterative. Um, you do it, and then you get to where you need to revise, and you revise, and then you go on, and then you go back, and you go on, and you go back. And that's not a bad thing. You, you go as far as you can until the basis of your work points out that something isn't working, and then you go back and change things a little, and, and so, so that it uh, gets produced that way. And when in writing, that, that really makes a difference if you're, if you're able to do that, if you're able to revise and continue and then say, oh, I know, now that I've gotten this far, I know what I need here. And you go do that, and that changes things there and on and on. So that, by the time I came to writing, I had been doing that for so long that um, I was used to it, and it was not an, an issue. Um, the Another useful thing that, that architecture gives you is the ability to, to look at the physical world and understand why things are the way they are physically. That is, and, you know, I can tell you what those arches are for, or what they were for when they were real. I think these are probably just um, can you tell us why the windows leak? <laughs> I could, yeah, I could. That's the most urgent question I have for this evening. Why are I'll, the windows leak? I'll climb up there after we're done and I'll let you know. Um, but, um, it, it, so you don't, you don't make an immediate judgment. You look at something and you figure out why it is that way. And it, that helps and especially helps in, in crime writing when um, things are not as they're presented. And the important thing is the thing that happened there that nobody made a big fuss about. Um, probably like the ceiling of your windows. Nobody made a big fuss about that either. <laughs> no, we didn't know enough. Um, actually, one of the most interesting books Shira ever wrote is the Bill Smith book. She alternates between Lydia Chin and Bill Smith, their partners in The Private Eye, but it's two different um, narrative voices, right? Two different points of view. And Bill Smith hires on as a brick laborer, and he's building a brick wall. Um, as the book goes on, and the whole investigation sort of goes from there. But I always thought, because you, you, you were building the plot brick by brick as Bill is actually being a brick. But I love That's that. I mean, core, I thought right? only sure I could actually oh. have written that book. That was um, Stone something. Uh, uh, no, no, no. The Concord? Concourse. 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 No, yeah. no colder place. No colder place. No colder place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you won, what, what award did you win for it? Was that? No, Colder Place won the, um, the, uh... Was it the Seamus? No. 
She's the one. Oh, the Anthony. The Anthony. The Anthony. Because <laughs> Shira won an extra for a later Bill yeah. Smith book, which took place on a college campus. One of the things that's so great about the series is that the Lydia books and the Bill books, although they are partners and always appear together in both of them, are so different. Yeah. You know, don't you think that they have really different personalities depending on which point of view, which is your character? Yeah. No, I absolutely. The um, the Lydia books are Lydia is young and optimistic, and she thinks not only can the world be saved, but she can help save it. You know, and and Bill has been around a lot longer, and he started out a lot more kind of beaten down, and uh, he is he doesn't think the world can be saved, but. One of the things he loves about Lydia is that she does, and so the the, the stories they deal with are, are different. Um, for one thing, hers a lot of hers are, are um, Chinese focused. His are not, um, and they they just deal with different situations and and in different moods. And I think when I'm writing one of them. I get toward the end and I can't wait to get to the other voice because that one is driving me nuts. And this happens whichever one it is. Um, are they both are they both sides of your personality? I think I think that must be. I think that must be what it is. You know, the the uh, you know, cheery turkey, you know <laughs> idealistic. And, and then and then the, you know, oh god, you know, I know I know what's really going on here. <laughs> the Yorker side comes out, right? So Jim, do you think you're always the same personality when you're writing your books? Karen's sitting in the back, so I have to say no. Uh, I think I, I'm, I'm very difficult to put up with when I'm not working on a book or a long story or something. Why is that? Uh, because it's, uh, it, I feel more at, at home in the world and more that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and that I'm doing it well. So you like voices in your head? And you're not crazy. Uh, it doesn't matter whether I like them or not. They're in there at all. Well, I mean, I mean people and, might worry if they heard voices in their heads, but for Jim, it's a normative state, which I think is fascinating. No, I walk down the street, and I'm, I'm hearing characters or potential characters talk to me, and I'm having story ideas. We all, never have dinner all alone. All time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, Rodney. And, you know, it's, it's been that way forever, and I'm yeah. just used to it. But I think when I'm not working on a, a project, whether it's a book of poetry or a, or a novel, or, of course, if it's a book of poetry, I have to hide it from Karen. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I just, I think I just get kind of growly and unpleasant. What about this guitar hoarding problem that you have? <laughs> That's a rumor. <laughs> I don't know what hoarding. Why, why, not, only, um, <laughs> not only does Jim come has the cat's it from my cat, but one of the guitars he hoards used to be mine. And it is one of the best guitars I've ever played in my life. Mm -hmm. Guitar. Yeah. Right. So Patrick, remind everybody that Jim plays here. Jim plays here. <laughs> no, I'll be uh, more specific. Yeah, no, his his, uh, his group, uh, Three Legged Dog, they play here usually on the last Friday of the month. Um, they take a break for the for the summer, but uh, it'll be starting up October the twenty fifth. Uh, Friday the 25th? No, well, yeah, maybe. No, it's um, Saturday's the 20th. Well, maybe it is, actually, yeah, now that I think of it. Right. And then I know, are you going to play this Friday of Thanksgiving week? Because that seems an interesting time. We were, we were just, just talking about, that. about yeah, that. I think it's yeah. the week of Friday before that. Okay. But we'll hash that out. Yeah. And then you right. play also all over town and folk festivals yeah. and coffee shops and. That's really fun. Jim fills up the whole store and he has all kinds of fans and they write him up in the Republic because they are performing here and it's really so if any of you have not had a chance to come and listen, you should. It's great music. And one of the many things sure I have in common is that we are both accordion lovers. <laughs> this is true. Is it an accordion to do bad? Oh yes. Yes, B. Uh, we, we all play multiple instruments, but B plays accordion along with bass and cello. Unexpected Italian blood in both of you. Huh? What can I say? Right. <laughs> so, do you all have questions that you would like to ask either of you? So, for many years, I kept looking at your website, waiting for another <laughs> 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 book. It was driving me nuts, and so I'm. I'm really so sorry. 
I know. You should. Because I was missing them. But um, so uh, um, I was happy to see another one come out. And I've already read it. So then, of course, the next question is, when's the next one? <laughs> we, were, we, were just, we were just talking about that. Um, I, I would like to say around this time next year, I'm really not sure. Um, I've you know got the contract and I'm working on it, and um, but I if that's up to the publisher and we're we're discussing that. And it'll be a Lydia and Bill. Yeah, it'll be a Bill. Yeah. Just a Bill. Well, no, I mean Bill with Lydia, oh, but Bill it's but narrated by Bill. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And you said you have one already in the works. No, no, that that that's is the the one. The one yeah, okay. I I have um a book that is not published that I've written, but it's not a Lydia and Bill. In fact, it's a thriller set in Mongolia. Now, this is something y'all want to read, right? <laughs> this is to Mongolia. Three times. I remember Three you sent me an email saying yeah. you were off to Mongolia, yeah. and I thought yeah. there must be a book in that. There is, there is a book in that, but um, I, it's hard to get a publisher interested because nobody knows where Mongolia is. Um, so, Ulan Bator. Oh, there you go, see? I know. Um, <laughs> It's actually on the Siberian Express. Should you ever want to go from Moscow to Vladivostok, on the you'll go right through Mongolia. Right through Mongolia and stop on Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital. But that is not a Bill and Lydia. So the the next Bill and Lydia is uh, is in the works. So it's a stretch to have Lydia have a Mongolian relative. Oh, come on. And I, you know, I thought about it. I this. <laughs> I'm serious. I, you know, I can get her sent to Mississippi. I'm not sure I can get her sent to, you know, the steppes. <laughs> the Altai Mountains. <laughs> I mean, we're all willing to go. Wouldn't you be willing to go to Mongolia with Lady? I certainly would. Why you know, and, and who did that? Um, uh, Ruth Rendell sent um, Wexford to China. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, Speaker of Mandarin. And I thought, boy, oh boy, this is the most... Um, convoluted. <laughs> he, he went on a um, a police exchange, right? They some Chinese cops came to England, and he went to China. I thought, boy, she really, really wanted to do this book. <laughs> you know what? Lisa C. Luce used that for her first three books, which yeah. were all mysteries, yeah. and it involved that. So it is not the a police exchange. Yeah. Yeah. As yeah. it might appear, except yeah. then it was lawyers. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Before and she wrote Snowflower and the Secret yeah. Fan, she wrote three absolutely fabulous yeah. mysteries. And yeah. the first yeah. one was called The Flower Net. Yeah. And so she had an American lawyer and a Chinese woman who was the the cop, and the American lawyer had to function in China. I thought they were actually yeah. wonderful. They were really good. But yeah. you know, if you can buy that one, you could. I don't you know. Certainly go to <laughs> Mongolia. A private, a private eye exchange with Mongolian absolutely. private eye. Yeah. Sure. I don't Didn't you write a co-write co a few books too? Or I did. I, I co-wrote two books, um, yeah. but the, and they have um, vampires and werewolves in them. Cool. Uh, the, but we uh, didn't work the same way a lot of co-writers do. Uh, we worked out the plot together. Uh, Carlos did the research, and I did the writing. Um, and th th these are really interesting books because they have multiple. Uh, they're all third person, but multiple close third person points of view. And for the first one, we got one review on Amazon that said, you know, this book was written by two people, and it's in a lot of voices, and clearly one of these people can write and the other one can't. <laughs> I don't know who wrote which part, but boy, I, I guess in, in some ways that's a success, right? You <laughs> I, I, mean, I clearly, you know, wrote a lot of different voices. But, um, yeah, those, those are fun. Those are fun. And, and if the publisher hadn't... Uh, um, basically <laughs> folded. <laughs> right. And what about uh, uh, Bill and Lydia Backlist? I mean, won the Edgar Award. You've had a wonderful series of books. Well, I'm why so, can't we buy them? I'm so glad you asked. Yeah. Um, the Backlist has uh, been recovered by me and my agent. It's re returned to us. Um, the last, yeah, the last, the last of them um, just came back. So all eleven books in the Backlist are now owned by me. Um, and we will be bringing them back. Bringing them back as ebooks is really easy. I would like them back as paperbacks. And that is, oh, there's somebody over there who wants them back as paperbacks too, yay. You might talk to Open Road Media. I might talk to Open Road. Um, we're, we're talking to uh, Pegasus 
and uh, uh, so, you know, there's a, uh, I'm sorry? Yeah. So, so we, yeah, I'm annoyed at Soho. They didn't want the uh, Mongolia book, but I'll talk to them. <laughs> I'll talk to them. There, there's got to be somebody willing to do this. And, you know, I mean, my position is I'll, I'll do it for a ham sandwich. You know, I, I will, I'll take it all on the back end. I don't need any advance for this. I want we'll them talk. all to we'll talk, because I want them all available in paper. No, I Thank you for asking. I think they should be. And yeah, I was actually didn't want to bring that up and distress you, but it is <laughs> annoying that you can't read. Um, I have loved them all. I've read, um, in fact, the first one, Mandarin Plaid, was one of our early first mystery club selections way back when. China Trade. China Trade. Was it China Trade? It was the first one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, whatever. Way back. It was. I liked it so much that it was one of our first mystery club picks back mm -hmm. in. God, when was it in the 90s? That was, yeah, that was in the place we've seen. 1994, that book came out. So, I don't know, it's been a long, long term relationship here, but it would be nice if you all could read them um, if you haven't read them. This the Glendale Library has it. The Glendale Library has it. Yeah, hey, Glendale Yay. Library. Yay. I read the first four, all because of the Glendale Library. Well, well that's really good to know. Library. Thank God for libraries. Right. So, Jim, um, speaking of publishing and all, I don't think Soho bought just one book from you because that's not a very good idea for publishers. So, do you have another book under contract? Uh, no, I don't, actually. Really? I, I, I really don't like to contract the books anymore. Ah. I, I like to just write them. You're like P.D. James. You write them and then you sell them? Uh, yeah, well, she always did. She never. Well, the first part I'm in control of. The second I have to just pray for. <laughs> but... Uh, no, they just bought the one, and then uh, we just mentioned that the, that we had just gotten back control of all the Wood Griffins, and uh, they picked those up. And then they're bringing out the nonfiction Difficult okay. Lives. That's a big sure. investment for them to make. If it you're is. only going to write one new book for them. It's huge. Well, I, I will be writing others. Oh, good. But they did this beautiful job of bringing out yeah. the Wood Griffins. Yeah. So, yeah, the next book will go to them, definitely. But uh, right now, I'm not sure what that well, that I knew. I thought it might be like Untitled James Allen's, which is what publishers speak for. We're going to publish this book, but we have no idea what it's about, and it doesn't even have a title. No, it was. Uh, they were very happy to just have one. So. Really? How about the Turner books, Jim? Uh, I don't really know what's going to happen with those. I think uh, I'm not even sure what the rights are at this point, uh, but we'll find out. Yeah, I know we've, we've had problems with on Drive and uh, the biography of Chester Hines, and I think we have still much to do, but I'm not sure. Yes, sir. When you write a book, how do you uh, how do you find a publisher? Do you just send copies out to all these publishing houses? <laughs> prayer. <laughs> no, 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 not prayer. Uh, that, that, that doesn't work? No, oh. not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Probably never did. Um, you have you have an agent. These days you have to have an agent. And so the process you're describing is what happens uh, when a an unagented author finds an agent. You send the book and, and a letter and you say, you know, I'd like you I'd like to work with you. And finally an agent takes you on. Um, my agent now, whatever I send him, he'll you know, he'll, he'll do his edit and then he chooses which publishers to send it to based on what editor is where, and, and uh, just, you know, who, who is looking for this kind of thing. And, and, what and if two publishers want the book? Oh, boy, are you in heaven. If two publishers want the book, uh, then your agent says, right, to, to one, you know, so-and-so wants it, make me an offer. And then you go to so-and-so, and you say, these guys offered this much money. What are you going to do? And you, you get an auction going. And sooner or later somebody drops out or or somebody says, you know, I'll give you three million dollars, but you know, you have until three o'clock to accept it, otherwise it's off the table. Um, this has never happened to me, uh, with money that high, but um, it, it, that's that's the, the process. But usually whoever whatever uh, publisher really loves it will will make you an offer and that's the one you, you really should go with because they love it. So you get money up front from the publisher? Sometimes. That's called an advance. It's an advance against sales. You, the author gets essentially 10% um, of the cover price, okay, one way or another. Either you get an advance, 
and then you have to make that up before you get any more, or you start getting royalties right away as soon as the book starts to sell. It amounts to the same amount of money, pretty much. Most authors don't get money right away. You have to wait until the publisher has earned back the advance money. They give you money to help you write the book. I mean, it's kind of a, a front, although if it's the first novel, you've already written the book because no publisher buys the first novel that's not yet been written. It wouldn't make any sense. But for subsequent <laughs> books, the advance allows you to um, live on it while you're, while you're writing the book. It's harder to get an agent than it is a publisher, and there are a lot of small publishers that don't require agents. So it's not entirely true that you have to have an agent. It depends on, um, on the publisher. Some require it, some don't care. And the agent gets a piece of what you get. The agent gets, um, it used to be 10%, and now I think it can be 15% is sort of standard, and in one amazing case I've learned recently, it's 40. 40? Oh, yeah. I um, hope that writer is making a huge fortune. They're doing fine. Um, but nonetheless, um, <laughs> you, was, you know, if you read about some book deal, you know, it's like $100,000, um, it can, if you amortize that over like two or three, usually a couple of years, you know, and you take out the agency and all the rest of it, it doesn't leave you nearly as much money as they don't pay it all to you up front. You know, they commit to that level. It's also like print runs. You know, they say it's going to be, you know, like 100,000 print run, and then they print as many books as they have orders. So they might print like 17,000. I mean, that's, Patrick and I are always up against that, you know, how many books should we buy because they're, they're either going to sell it out and then we can't get them, or, you know, sometimes they do it so short that they run out of books before the publication date. So we have to order books increasingly far in advance just to make sure we have any books at all. So, and we're just guessing, you know, we might not have read it, we might not know the author's coming, and... You know, it's a complicated business, and um, there's a lot of gambling, really, that goes on, isn't yeah. there, on the part of the author, on the part of the bookseller, on the part of the publisher? Because none of us really know what you're going to want. Yeah. You know, that's the really hard part. We cannot figure out, any of us, which book everyone's going to want to read, right? And, and, and every now and then a, a book really hits, and everybody says, boy, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I never would have thought that that one... Like, where did the crawdad sing? My like favorite the, like example. The, the crawdads, right. On the yeah. other hand, Margaret Atwood, there was so much money thrown at that, and that book was so heavily pre-sold that by the time it got here, it was like a big yawn, right? right. In a sense. <laughs> but, um, but keep in mind that the first one, right? you know, that, that book the is handmaid. now 25 years old, The Handmaid's Tale. It was 20 years before they made the TV show that made it huge. So, I mean, she's doing fine. She's, you know, she's a writer. She's got lots of things going on. But that, the, the level that The Handmaid's Tale got to, who would have thought, you know, until 25 years later? So, you know, you, you, it, it really is a guessing It's game. a totally yeah. unpredictable yeah. thing, you know, and it's all because you all have such different tastes. You know, if I, could, if I could, like, zap you all and say, this is it, this is the book, you know, we want you all to read this, that'd be great, but you guys won't put up with that. It's really too bad. <laughs> yes. You're looking. Oh, I'm just sitting here thinking about this back list. You, you refer to it as back list? The back list, yeah, the, the books that you recently <laughs> published, yeah. Um, so, on your series, will we see that next year, this year? Um, uh, how you do know, you find out about it? Uh, you, well, you'll, you, Barbara, Barbara <laughs> will know. Um, <laughs> it, um, it depends. You know, there's, it's, it's possible it'll be done the way these are being done and they'll all be out within a couple of months. It's also possible they will do one or two a year, um, whoever they are, you know, that, that partly depends on, on who is doing it. Um, I, I, that I don't know, but, um, but, but Barbara will. And yeah. why does this happen? Why does it happen? Because the, what the, publisher, the publisher buys the book, okay? The, the publisher buys the book, and the deal is they will keep it in print, and you as will get as, 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 as long as there's a demand for it, and you'll get X team dollars for you know every copy sold. Um, to get the backlist back, it has to have been out of print for a certain amount of time. 
meaning it can't be gotten in a new copy. I mean, used copies they can't control, but a new copy can't can't be gotten, can't be ordered, isn't available. There are none in the in the warehouse. They're they're all gone. Uh, to prove that is is not as easy as as, as easy as it sounds. And um, for example, if Margaret Atwood had been out of print at all, once The Handmaid's Tale hit, if I had owned any of her, if I were a publisher and owned any of her books, I would have brought it back immediately. So she might have thought it was out of print, and suddenly it wasn't. So it's, it's you know, publishers are in business to make money. And they want to make sure that when they give you back, back your backlist that they're not losing any money on that. And they so. are, because they're giving up your digital rights. Yeah, yeah. Pretty hard. I'm astonished that you got your backlist back for your publisher. I just almost fell off my chair when you said that. Her publisher is notorious for never returning the backlist, so and that's well done. Here. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know what Josh told them, but I don't ever want him to tell us anything. Death threats or something. Yeah. Really. Was there a question over here? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, about the paper sun. What, when did you actually write? It's been a long time since. Pub did you write it sooner and it just didn't get published till now? No, well, you know, it takes about a year. I mean, it, it always, a publisher will buy a book and then it takes a year to put it out. So it came out in July 2019. We sold it 2018. I think I finished it um, a little under a year before that. Wow. But having done that, then my um, agent had to you know, read it and, and do his edits, and I had to edit it, and then he had to try to sell it. So, um, so it was around 17? I think I finished it in 2017, yeah. And by the way, those are the last of the books because the hardcover print <coughs> is totally sold out, yeah, and it yeah. won't be available until the paperback comes out. And so who knows when that is? So. That's it up there. I bought the very last ones. Um, so if you wanted to buy buy them for anybody for Christmas, yeah, you might want to do it sure now. Time, because they're, <laughs> when it's gone, it's gone. That's the way it will be. Anybody else have a question? Tom? Um, but I had a follow up question. Oh, sorry. Because it ha sorry, because it had been so long, and all of this. Lydia and Bill have not to do with politics and, and never had. But this came out, it was all about immigration and immigration stuff and whatever. Did that influence you at all? Or was it purely your friend moved to Mississippi and wham, it happened? Well, you know, the immigration is always a question. And, and yeah. um, as I follow Chinese uh, cultural affairs, it's always been an issue in this country. and. That was where this, where the book came from. Now, the, the fact that it happened to hit at a moment when immigration is a very hot button issue is that's coincidence. But it is coincidence I don't mind at all. Tom, uh, Jim, at the beginning of the night, you mentioned some things you either had to give up or sacrifice in order to write or to, to pursue it as a career. Would you mind talking a little bit about that? If it's not too personal, I gave up money. Uh, that, that was easy because I didn't have any. Uh, uh, it's the time. I, the, the biggest thing, in, and I tell my students this all the time, is you spend an awful, awful lot of time by yourself, alone, and you give up friends, and you give up friendships, and doing things with friends, and you can uh, shortchange your family pretty severely if you have one. I didn't have one for a long time. I do now, and I hope she doesn't. But, uh, you know, I lived in garage apartments, and I lived not knowing how I was going to pay the rent the next month for a long, long time. Uh, and I didn't see that as a sacrifice in any way. I just thought, you know, that's just the way I live. And part of writing well and developing the writer was, was being hungry. And, and being apart from life and absorbing things. So, you know, in, in, in some way, yes, I did give up a lot, but in another way, I think that's, that's a strong part of who I am, and it certainly feeds into the characters that I'm most interested in writing about. Think of that as a reader, too. You can't really read while you're conversing and having dinner and other stuff. And, you know, I think a lot of people, um, serious, I love his slogan I saw today. Um, I'm trying to remember books. Um, how did it go? It'll come to me in a minute. Books, um, 
saving introverts from conversations since 1454. <laughs> so, uh, and Karen Slaughter, who actually is a serious introvert, comes to it. I don't have that quote right, right, but it's very close. Um, you know, books can be an escape, but it's really hard to, to find time to read, which, you know, is a solipsis activity as opposed to a group activity like watching a movie or going to a sports event or something. So all of you are readers, so you all know that you know you have to really work at it sometimes to find enough time to enjoy your book. Um, and it's hard when you pick it up and put it down and pick it up and put it down in the sort of course of daily life. You know, you'd like to be able to just sling your hammock or something and you know dive into your book. So Patrick and I can tell you, as booksellers, the biggest sacrifice we've made is reading. We were so busy, at, you know, selling your books and all that we don't have a lot of time for personal reading. Uh, I, I'm blessed with a wife who disappears onto the sofa to read uh, three or four books a, a day sometimes. <laughs> oh my God! That sort of tells no. me that she needs tea now and again. It seems like. Boy, that. are you lucky! When we first met, she would come over and read while I was writing. I'd never been able to write with anyone else in the room. So. That's how you knew this was magic. That was it. I am so impressed. I'm going to have to get rid of our dogs. They are, <laughs> <laughs> they are a constant interruption. <laughs> teach, them, teach, them, teach them to read to you. Teach them to read to me. Right. Anyway, um, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. And we have forgotten, uh, Patrick and I both, to say that this is Jim's publication party. The book is not actually out until October 1st, but we persuaded the publisher to let us have it tonight because sure, I've just been his friend and have you been a student? I, uh, that's the one thing I've not been as a student. Okay. You know, but anyway, his, just share sure you know. Right, so to put them together, um, so you guys have a very special chance tonight to have a book that um, nobody else is going to get to read until October 1st. So thank you for coming. Um, thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. Right here at this table and sign their books. So feel free to um, get in line and take photos and all the rest of it. Be glad it was not last night in the rain and have a safe trip home. <laughs> So Sandra sent me. Actually, I have one that I might be able to give you because it freaked Rodney out so badly that he wouldn't go near it. It's a. We got one of those tubes. Yeah. I'm scoping it out. They have a, a track that attaches to the window that's got a ball in it that they can pop. Rodney wouldn't go anywhere near it. He was freaked out so bad I had to hide it. Oh, really? You guys want to try it? Sure. Yeah, so next time we're together, I'll give it to you because I think it was a ball. I think he thought it was a snitch. I mean, where would he have known the snake that he instinctively freaked out by it? Yeah, because I'm not a selfish person.
Bit seems kind of not really interested in playing. Yeah. Um, and then he fell down again, but he's still down because of that. 